All right. Um, looks like we give you guys a few more minutes of memory model, which may be a good thing. It's really cool verification stuff. That was really, really nice talk. So please uh, interrupt at any time with questions. Um, it's more important to uh, have a discussion and, and get me to understand what's going on with you guys and vice versa than it is to get through a set set of slides. In any case, uh, I last did one of these about two years ago. And uh, it was, uh, and we got some stuff we're going to go through here, uh, time permitting. I mean, I, uh, some parts of it I'll skip or not, depending on how things go. But uh, we've got this thing called the PSABI, and it defines a bunch of stuff. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it doesn't necessarily cover a memory model. And this, uh, there's one of these now for hardware. Uh, this, incense, this thing essentially provides a manual to let compiler writers know what code they should generate. And with BPF, this is kind of implicit. Uh, there's JIT source code and also LLVM implementation, which are kind of the sources of truth for this documentation, which, you know, source code is a documentation, can be a good thing. Um, now, uh, back two years ago, I said, look, we should use Linux kernel memory model because, well, in part because the other memory models are kind of a strict subset. The Linux kernel memory model promises more ordering than the other ones do by design. It's, it's set up to do that because it needs to cover all the CPUs that can be out there. Okay, so that's easy enough, except that uh, a month or two ago, Alexi says, hey, we need some more BPFM work. And I'm going, okay, I'm not sure what, but yeah, you know. And, and this reminded me back uh, a long time ago in high school, we had a vice principal. He's kind of, uh, I mean, he's not the principal in charge of vice. That was a joke back then, but not really. He's the, kind of a principal and yet a vice principal's. This guy had a poster up on his wall. It was a line drawing. It shows this guy, he's kind of a disreputable guy. He's got kind of shaggy hair. He's got you know, a few days growth of beard. He's got one black eye and several teeth missing. And he's got this manic smile on his face. And the caption to that poster, and this was kind of my attitude towards this thing, is we attack your problems with enthusiasm. Okay, so I don't know what's broken, but I'm gonna fix it. Okay, I can take care of this. Uh, but to my surprise, I got this email from Jose Marchese, who I've met before, and he's going, hey, it's great to hear you're working on this. I'm going, okay, why are you so excited about this? But uh, what turned out is that uh, there's a bunch of things that have to happen with this. And one of them is that we need to concurrently share data between a bunch of different places. So you could have multiple BPF programs that have common maps, common data. Uh, you have BPF programs talking to user space programs in various ways. And also, of course, you have helpers in kernel code, and you have to get that straight as well. So, you know, there, there is some potential problem to be solved here. And here's why, uh, why Jose, as near as I tell, I, I actually met him. He was at the Rust uh, workshop, uh, Rust and Linux workshop uh, in September, and I met him shortly after that. And the thing is, we got these memory models at the language level, We've also got it down at the ISA, and some of these things are formal and executable. You can say, all right, here's this stuff, tell me what happens. And that's really nice. But we don't really have a formal memory model for the BPF instruction set itself. And of course, Jose, he's in the compiler bucket there, in the little compiler arrow. And so he really wants to know precisely what's going on with the memory model so that he can generate the proper code. I mean, you know, totally understandable. And uh, well, that's what this talk is about. If I can do the right thing here, I don't, did not want to do that. Uh, let's see if I didn't, okay. It looks like I managed not to break anything. Okay, don't worry, I, uh, I won't manage to not break anything again. So that's what this talk is about. This talk is about very specifically supplying a memory model for the BPF instruction set itself. Um, all right. Uh, so there, we'll touch on a bunch of other things. There's some future work possible expansions of the BPF instruction set, we'll, and we'll look at those later, but the main part of the talk is gonna be pretty focused, just on the instruction set and the memory model. Um, so, as I say, more work required, but this is kind of the next step. There we are. So the Linux kernel uh, uses assembly, C, and actually there's some Rust. Uh, uh, Alice Real uh, showed me a smartphone that was running a Rust language Android binder inside the kernel. So, you know, that's, they're actually doing some pretty impressive stuff with that. And of course, assembly has been around forever, it has SC. And the thing is, 
uh, that because of the special requirements of the Linux kernel, the Linux kernel memory model is not just confined to the same sorts of orderings that a language is going to get promise you. Part of the reason for this is that a lot of the compiler writers really seriously, truly, and uh, horribly hate the idea of tracking dependencies in the compiler. And so they say no to that. And that means that the language memory models don't know about dependencies. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those are and how those work later. And that means that the Linux kernel memory model relies not just on the compiler, but also on some strict coding conventions. And I'm not gonna go through this in detail. Uh, we'll look at one of them uh, later on in the slides, we get there. But if you look at memory barriers.txt in the documentation directory and search for the control dependencies, there's a big, big list of things. If you want your control dependencies to, to work, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other thing. And for address and data dependencies, which are used by RCU, there's an RCU dereference.rst in documentation slash RCU that gives out a bunch of restrictions, uh, things you're not supposed to do to your pointers uh, in, if you want your stuff to work. All right. But the downside of the language models and the compiler writers hating tracking dependencies is that they, is they are afflicted with something called out of thin air problem. Um, and uh, what that means is that we don't want to use a language level model for the BPF instruction set. It is after all instructions, it's kind of both. We saw that it was kind of in the middle. There was language stuff above it a couple slides ago and then there was instructions below it. And for the purpose of this presentation, we're grouping it more with the instructions that's below it because we don't want out of thin air values. Um, and the hardware instruction sets avoid those. So here's the canonical example of out of thin air. Um, this is a C11 program. Uh, you could kind of sort of get the same thing in Linux kernel with read once and write once, but not exactly. Um, uh, the difference is the compiler is allowed to reorder things if it wants to. So we've got the first thread over there on your right, um, excuse me, on your, on your left, um, yeah, uh, and it's picking up X and putting it into a local variable R1, could be a register, and then it's storing that. And we're starting out with X and Y both zero initially. So it's just picking up X with no ordering and storing it to Y. Now, at the hardware level, it's really hard to store something before you've loaded it, all right? But the language level models don't recognize dependencies, so they don't know about that. As a result, on the other side, we're doing it the opposite order, picking up Y and storing the X. And if you take the mathematical core, take the mathematical core of the C11 memory model, it is perfectly legitimate for the answer to come out 42 for both X and Y. Now, that's just in theory, not in practice. There is no compiler or hardware that can actually do that, but the mathematical core of the C11 and C++11 memory models would allow that to happen, all right? Now, there's, it's accompanied by a little note that says, don't do OOTA without saying what it is because nobody's figured out how to precisely formalize it in a way that the compiler writers are willing to put up with. So as a result of that, we don't, we, don't want, we don't want BPF to do that kind of stuff, okay? And we'd like to make it easy for analysis tools to work that out. Therefore, we're going at the hardware level we're, and we're gonna be honoring dependencies. Okay, there we go. So we don't have to look at all the BPF instructions. We do have to look at the atomics, the conditional jump instructions, load instructions, and memory reference instructions. Uh, so we'll deal with those. Uh, and why isn't load a memory reference instruction? Well, yeah, it is, but, but there's uh, um, special things with uh, load that and store is a subset of that. So we'll treat them separately. Let's start with the atomic instructions. And the idea is that we want to make, we got this implicit memory model now. We want to make that explicit, again, so that tooling and compilers and JITs can take full advantage of it. All right. So... Uh, we'll start off with the atomics. So this is, we have three sets of atomics. These are the exchange and compare exchange instructions. Okay. And uh, we also have, uh, we'll also take a look at add, or, and so on, and also look at BPF fetch in combination with the add, or, and, and XOR. 
All right, so first we'll do exchange and compare exchange. They're fully ordered. What that means is if you have, let's just take an exchange, a VPF exchange instruction with all the stuff that takes it happen. All CPUs, tasks, whatever, all entities in the system are going to agree that everything that preceded that instruction in that task is ordered before that exchange, and that exchange is also ordered before everything afterwards, all right? Um, and that's gonna be global across the whole system. And that's consistent with the way that the atomics uh, exchange, atomic compare exchange APIs work in the Linux kernel. Uh, or if you prefer, you can use the relaxed compare exchange, put a full memory barrier before and after. Either way, you get the full ordering of everything. Okay, that's straightforward enough. Uh, the next set of atomics are just the add or and an XOR, but without BPF fetch. All right. And in that case, they're unordered. Uh, that means that the CPU, the JIT, the compiler, whatever, can order stuff freely across them. That's perfectly legitimate. And they're consistent with the Linux kernel non-value returning atomics. Atomic add, atomic or, atomic and, and atomic XOR. So these are unordered. They can be freely ordered. Those instructions have no ordering semantics. And then uh, finally for the atomics, uh, you can, there's this BPF fetch modifier. If you combine that with one of the BPF add or and and XOR things, uh, that gives you a value back. So the difference between not having the fetch and having the fetch, without the fetch, it just does its atomic and that's that, you don't see what happened. With the fetch, you get the, get the value back. And in that case, they're all going to agree. Every, it's fully ordered again. Everything before that atomic will appear to be ordered before that atomic from everybody's viewpoint. And likewise, that atomic will appear to be ordered before everything after it. And again, that's consistent with the value returning APIs in Linux kernel. Okay, so we're through the atomics. Let's take a look at the jump instructions. And this is only the conditional jump instructions. Uh, the unconditional brush jump instructions have no ordering semantics. So this is kind of strange. What we have is that in many architectures, in many computer architectures, a jump instruction, conditional jump instruction, has very weak but still very useful ordering semantics. And the way that works is that um, uh, the, the, this is again just the full list of them. And the thing here, the thing that's important is if your JIT is too smart, it needs to be careful. So the weak ordering applies, you got a load instruction and that load instructions value may go through some processing and then ends up at either the source or the destination registers, the two things that are being compared by the jump instruction. And if there's a store instruction after that jump instruction where control flow either goes to it, okay, but that's before the control flow converges, if all that stuff holds true, then the load instruction that the value came from will be ordered weekly before the store instruction. And that kind of intuitively makes sense if you're going to decide whether to store something and you're loading something to figure that out, you kind of have to do this load before you do the store. But uh, there's a couple caveats here. First off, the compilers are not helping us here. The compilers do not understand control dependencies and we'll happily break them. And we'll see uh, an example of why this control stool converges qualifier is needed. Um, uh, with control, conditional move instructions a little later. All right, so here's an example. So we've got uh, some, kind of some Linux kernel C code over there on the one side, and we've got uh, the BPF instruction assembly on the other side. So we do a read once of X. If the value comes back is non-zero, then we write 42 to Y. And on the BPF side, we get the address of X and put it in R1. And so the colors match up with what, what compile code goes with question assembly instructions. And then we go and we pick that address up. We pick up that, we load X on the second line. And then we've got if R1 equals zero. So we've got R1, which value came from that load. That's mentioned in that branch instruction. So that's one of the conditions we had to meet. And then we say go to LBB uh, O2 down there on the bottom. So that means those three green instructions are within the scope. They're, they're there before control flow converged. 
And that means the store, we pick up the address Y, we pick up 42 and then we store them. That store is therefore ordered very weakly after the load that's on the second yellow line. So the last green line is ordered after the last yellow line. And that's a control dependency. And this is a case where everything works out and it's nice. Um, but the thing is the compilers don't understand these and can break them. This is an example, one example of many, where the breakage would happen. Here we read X. If it's non zero, we store Y1, but if it's zero, we store Y1 as well. Now, presumably you'd have other stuff within an else statement, it wouldn't be quite as silly, but this is a minimal example. In this case, the compiler can and will optimize it as follows. Oh, well, we're doing it both cases, either side, so I don't care, I'll just pick it up and I'll store it, forget the if statement. And if there's other stuff in the if statement, the compiler may just hoist that particular store out of the if statement and leave the rest of it in the if statement. Either way, there are CPUs that will reorder that. Okay, so if you, and this is an example, I said earlier that we don't just rely on the language memory model for Linux kernel memory model, we also rely on coding restrictions. And for control dependencies, which by the way, um, please be very careful with them. They're fragile and easily broken. If you only use them if you absolutely have to for performance reasons, is one of the reasons why. Um, one of the coding restrictions is if you're storing, you better not store the same thing on both sides of the if statement. At least not so the compiler can figure it out. Okay, uh, like I said, please avoid them <laughs> when you can. All right, so that's a broken dependency. Uh, that's why the coding standards exist. That's why the memory barriers.txt has that section in it that you should read if you're ever gonna use them. Um, and uh, the thing is, you're going, okay, well, wait a minute, we got a whole bunch of different architectures and some of them do different things, what happens? And there's two different groups. The strongly ordered architectures, x86, IBM mainframe and so on, they use TSO. And that means if you have a load instruction, it's gonna be ordered against all the following store instructions, no matter what, and so you're covered. You have a load instruction, whether you have the if or not, doesn't matter, the store instruction came later, it's ordered. Uh, the weekly order ones, ARM, V8, PowerPC, and so on, maybe RISC-V, uh, what happens is that the hardware actually tracks the control dependencies for you. And so it realized, oh, we loaded this, it went into this branch statement, we've got this stuff under here that came after that, therefore I need to order it. But either way, no matter what kind of CPU you have, uh, the ordering is, is preserved. Okay, uh, what do we mean by weak? I've mentioned several times it's weak ordering. Well. With the atomics, we said that all the CPUs and threads, no matter where, agreed that we had one group of instructions, we had the atomic instruction, we had another group of instructions, that those three groups were ordered. Everybody agreed that here, uh, not so much. It's visible to a given another CPU, but separately to the different CPUs. What the heck does that mean, okay? Well, uh, if we take a look over here, this is an example where you, the ordering isn't helping you. And the reason is, it's the ordering is visible separately to each CPU. Here we're trying to see that ordering across the, the center and the rightmost CPUs. So we stored one to X, we have a control dependency, we picked up X, uh, we do a write to Y only if X is, is uh, true, and that means that there's weak ordering between that uh, read once and that write once in the center there. And the right-hand side does a SMP load acquire, and that does acquire uh, ordering, which in the case of the Linux kernel memory model applies. If you were in uh, C++ or C, you'd still have a problem. And then we read X. Now, if we had ordering across both threads, that read of X on the far right there would be guaranteed to C1, okay? Because we did a write, we read that write, we did another write, and then we read that write, should be later, right? Except that the ordering by control dependencies is only from one CPU to another. Here we have three CPUs involved. We have to see the ordering across all of them. And therefore you really truly can see both R, both R zeros equal to zero. And there are CPUs that will really do this, all right? And so when you're using, and this is another reason to be careful to control dependencies. They're a little more limited than you'd like, or might like, I suppose. Now, I said earlier that the store had to be before control flow converged, all right? And that doesn't make sense for the uh, strongly ordered things because if it's after, it's after, right? Who cares? 
For the weakly ordered ones, well, it's just, it doesn't know that things converge, it sees the branch. But the problem is the compilers can optimize and there are these conditional move instructions. And that means we can see things like this. Um, what happened is that we had a read once, we did an if, we stored different values, which means that the compiler is not going to break us that way. And then we stored to a different variable. And the control flow converges before we do that final store. Well, the compiler, if it has a conditional move instruction, could do something like the assembly language in the uh, uh, right-hand column there. It can do the load all right. It can, it can also then just say, okay, if, if the condition is true, we're going we're gonna to do the move. Otherwise, we're not, and then we're gonna then we're gonna store, and that means that there is no branch. There's just the conditional move, and so that means that the hardware tracking done by ARM V8, for example, only applies to the red arrows there. It does not apply down to the move. So conditional um, control dependencies only apply up to the point where control flow converges. Okay, load instructions, um, and what happens here is that if we do a load instruction and we use the value uh, loaded to compute the address of a later store, that's an address dependency, all right? And intuitively, of course, if you've, if you've picked up a value and use it as an address later, you, you really can't go backwards in time. You can't, uh, you can't guess, so there's some ordering there. And uh, this, is, this is, in fact, respected by all CPUs again, and it's uh, weak in kind of the same sense that the, uh, that the control dependencies are weak, that the branches provide weak ordering. Um, and again, we have different ways that this happens. Um, in the strongly ordered things, they order all, order all loads before all stores, so that's good. In the uh, weakly ordered cases, and also loads before loads for that matter, um, in the weekly ordered cases, we, those things are tracked by the hardware again. And weakness happens in the same way um, in some of the weekly ordered architectures. These things are only pairwise from one CPU to another. So if you have something involving multiple CPUs expecting the ordering, it doesn't transitively play out just like it did for control dependencies. Okay. And the final thing here for memory reference instructions, all of them, if you're referencing just a single variable, so you got a bunch of threads and they're playing with just a single variable, which by the way, isn't that great for scalability, but still it's something that makes sense in some cases. Um, all the CPUs and tasks will see some global order consistent with the loads and stores. It'll be as if all of those loads and stores happen in some global order. And uh, this is actually supported by all CPU architectures with Itanium being the exception that proves the rule. But the reason we get away with that in the Linux kernel is that Itanium is volatile, which is used by read once and write once, to generate load acquires and store release instructions. And those things provide heavy ordering. So that's why, uh, but Itanium might be on its way out. I think it got removed and maybe coming back in. I'm not sure what's happening with it. In any case, I'm not too worried about it. Um, as long as the compilers still do what they've always done, it'll work fine. If not, they did a bug and they need to fix it. And if it's not here, we don't have to worry about it at all. Uh, sorry if you like Itanium. What can I say? I liked it too back in the 90s. <laughs> they didn't come back out with it as quickly as they wanted. That, that kind of <laughs> soured me on it a bit. Okay, so JITs have to respect memory ordering. Okay. Um, and there's a bunch of viable strategies. The, the things that are tricky here are the address control and data dependencies. And one way is to just generate instructions that match the BPF instruction set fairly closely, all right? So if you have a branch, generate a branch, okay? Maybe you can do a conditional move if you are careful. Um, and uh, another thing you can do is you put atomic signal fence, memory or CST everywhere, basically telling so anything downstream not to reorder things, the compiler not to reorder things. Uh, and the other thing you do is you could explicitly track and preserve the dependencies. So those are kind of like three strategies you could use to preserve the address control and data dependencies. Um, the first one being the easiest, the second one not being too bad, the third one being, well, if, if somebody makes that work, that'll be wonderful because then it'll be available for the compiler writers and maybe we can make the language a little more, <laughs> memory models be a little more sane. I'd like that. A lot of people wouldn't, but I'd like it. The other thing we can do is we could just say that any 
or loads have to be ordered before prior store and then do whatever is necessary to make that happen. Uh, this is something that works quite well on the strongly ordered instruction sets, okay? Um, and there was some, uh, there's some push to make this, make C11 and C11 relaxed atomics obey this, although ARM came out very heavily strongly against this a week ago. Uh, the other thing you do is you can rely on the source code following the Linux kernel coding standards. So those are different strategies that are available when you're doing JITs. Um, doing JITs straightforwardly shouldn't be a problem. I heard a rumor that people are actually taking the BPF assembly language, turning into uh, uh, LLVM intermediate uh, representation, and then doing full compiler stuff on it, in which case all bets are off. But um, if you're doing that, you know, be careful, please. Okay, um, we're getting towards the end here. I'm, just, I'm gonna do a couple of these. These are just a bunch of examples that I did to say, was I being sane? What I did was I took the GCC atomic built-ins. This is a little bit weird. I'm using the GCC built-ins as defined by GCC, but I was using a uh, Godbolt compiler thing with a Clang backend, all right? Um, so, uh, you know, uh, yes, it's the GCC uh, API, but I'm using the Clang compiler. Now, the GCC Atomics has all the orderings that you'd expect from C11 and C11, uh, relax, acquire, so on. Uh, they're all there. With uh, the BPF instruction set, as it is today, we only have to worry about two groups. One group is relaxed, which has no ordering, and all the rest of them get full ordering because that's what we can do right now. And if BPF were to add some sort of acquire load, release store, or some sort of weaker memory barrier, then we, we would revisit this and possibly have some of these things not be fully ordered. Right now, that's the choice we have. Um, I'm gonna look at atomic thread fence of atomic uh, SC, the sequentially consistent atomic fence. Uh, BPF doesn't have memory barrier instructions in this instruction set, but that's okay, because um, you can do an atomic uh, and get full ordering. So if you do an atomic with, uh, with a field that isn't involved in anything. And in fact, the Linux kernel does with this with SMPMB. If you go look on x86 on recent Linux kernels, the full barrier in the Linux kernel on x86 ends up being an atomic instruction uh, working on a stack variable. And that sounds kind of strange. I mean, you got mfence, right? What the heck are you doing that for? Well, it turns out that mfence has a bunch of extra semantics involving I.O. and things like that that make it slow. And doing an atomic instruction, doing a useless atomic instruction that's only there for the ordering turns out to be quite a bit faster. So that's what they do. Anyway, so BPF can do the same thing. Why not, right? And so we're going to call that BPFMB just because if I try to write all that on every slide, it'll get to be a mess. So I'm going to take a look at loads and stores, and then we'll be, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll take a look at loads, and then we'll go to the future work part. So this thing called atomic load in and atomic load, which, by the way, um, Clang does not yet support. If you try to actually do one of these in Clang, it'll tell you, I, my backend doesn't know about this, forget it. Now, if you do it for x86 or one of the other ones, it, it doesn't know about it for BPF. But it could. And one way to make it work is, in the relaxed case, just do a BPF load or BPF load LDX, depending on what size you're doing. And if you have non-relaxed ordering, you do the same load or store, but you follow it with a BPFMB, all right, for the other orderings. And so that's straightforward enough. And the same sort of thing happens with store, which, by the way, is not yet supported, or wasn't when I ran this. Maybe somebody fixed it already. I didn't think to check. Um, and again, you do a BPF store or SDX, and, uh, um, and I've got a bug on the slide. I'm sorry, that should be, no, I've got it right. I'm just confused this morning, all right or I'm doubly confused and I have it wrong and I'm confused about being confused, who knows. Uh, but uh, to make that work, you would do this BPFMB funny atomic instruction followed by the store or SDX and that's how you get a non-relaxed ordering store. Okay, so we have exchange, it does what you'd expect, it supplies for ordering because it does. Uh, compare exchange, same, same difference. And uh, the fetch ops, um, uh, you know, you do what you'd expect with those. Uh, and here, LLVM Clang uh, for both of these actually does all of them, but there's this funny NAND thing that it doesn't do. Uh, it could, it'd have to make the pair exchange loop out of it. And likewise with OpFetch. And there's miscellaneous atomics, which can be done, and uh, fences, which would be implemented that way. 
Uh, atomic signal fence is a little bit strange. Um, you'd have to do the same, as far as I know, you'd have to do the same inline assembly trick that uh, the Linux kernel does for the compiler barrier, which is you have an ASM that has nothing, no instructions, but it uses the memory clobber. And that doesn't actually generate any code, but it tells the compiler to forget everything it knows about memory. It's a little bit ugly, and then it causes bridges to get flushed and stuff like that, but it, but it works. There might, it would be really cool to have a, this function might return, might not return clobber on the ASMs. And uh, there's some, I, I need to ask people around here about that. I, I may as well, here I may as well right now. Um, it'd be really cool to be able to tell the thing, this ASM might not return, because then it could preserve the registers, but have the right ordering still, but you know, who knows. Okay. <clears throat> And uh, so let's talk about things that might happen in the future here. Uh, we might have, uh, uh, we might need to worry about BPF programs and helpers. Right now, the story is that they have to define what ordering can supply, if any. We don't want to force them to have ordering because they need to be lightweight. Some of them do. Uh, different programming languages is kind of a, it's solved in practice just by people careful, being careful. But if you have a BPF program in one language and BPF in another program in another language and a sharing memory, you have two different memory models and the compiler writers have to be careful to take care of advantage of that, not to a lot make that work. User kernel interaction, um, we have the same thing as for different programming languages. And there's a bunch of other things that happen where there's queues from the kernel to the user space and that ordering is provided by those queues. And uh, perhaps the BPF instruction set will gain some things. I'm gonna skip through here a little bit rather than going through the, um, I guess I'm gonna focus on this one a little bit. Um, the compilers have to respect the BPF memory model as do the JITs, and if that happens, things work out with multiple languages. So that's the thing that makes that work. Um, formal verification tooling, uh, we might get some things going there, uh, but I wanna get agreement on what this is first. And perhaps we'll have acquire loads, release stores and full barriers. if. If we do, then we can modify the memory model appropriately. Okay, so that's what we've got there. Uh, I can take questions or uh, even respond offline or whichever. Either I've uh, bored people to death or uh, got it right or, or people too scared to ask questions. I'm not sure which. We got one. All right. <laughs> okay. What's the question? Oh, <laughs> are people too scared to ask questions? The, 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 the he was claiming it was a third of my options, which are people too scared to ask questions. In the question form, they well, are people too scared scared to ask questions? In which case, I have to ask you guys that question. Did you have a chance to look into the current state uh, from compiler side and also JIT side? Um, whether you found any inconsistencies that definitely needs fixing or not yet? Uh, the ones I looked at, um, I kind of blasted through them. And I apologize for that. The ones I, I looked at did, the, did what I would have expected. Uh, uh, there were a bunch that didn't generate anything, but you know, that's, if people aren't using it, maybe they don't need to. But I haven't, I checked that a few weeks ago. So I, if somebody did something uh, last week, I'm sorry, I don't know about it. Good question, uh, so we'll have to keep checking. Oh, there's a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, um, can I see it? Well, maybe I can. Well, why don't you just read it? Why don't you just read it out? Okay, so the question is, you mentioned issues with code that transformed LVMIR. Does the same apply to BPF2C that, ra that raises from BPF assembly to C, used for offline verification and native code generation? Okay, uh, it, it could, might well. Uh, you know, if, if you were to, uh, no, mat no matter what you do, if you take the BPF instructions, then put them through something that has a full-fledged compiler at the end, that full-fledged compiler is not necessarily going to pay attention to address data and control dependencies. Um, and so those would either have to be, either you have to do something in generating the C to preserve those, and we went through a few options to do that, or you have to rely again on coding conventions at the program level, the level of the source code that generated BPF instructions to make it so those transformations just can't happen. 
Yeah, my question is, do you think it's worthwhile to uh, say that BPF uh, has control dependencies or maybe you can just say, no, control dependencies are not part of the BPF memory model? Um, I, I considered that. Uh, so the, the thing is the control dependencies are troublesome. Um, I was not all that excited about control dependencies being added to the Linux kernel, to be honest with you. And then if you go read that thing I pointed out, you find a lot of scary text. This can happen, this can break, that can, I, I wrote that with the intent of discouraging people. But there are some places where performance is really important. We don't use control dependencies very many places in the Linux kernel, but they are used. And where they are used, I mean, they are, uh, you know, on the weekly order machines, it makes a difference not having the memory barrier there in some of the places where they're logging and transferring stuff into queues and stuff like that. So I figured that um, it would be a mistake to leave them out because they are used a little bit. But um, in most cases where you're thinking about using them, it's probably a mistake to use them. Not in all cases, but in most. Good questions. More? If not, thank you very much for your time and attention, and uh, thank you for the people having the courage to ask the questions. Cheers.